Okay, uh, welcome everybody. Um, while we're waiting for other folks to, uh, to join in, I, I put just a little quiz question here on the screen. I think you can all see it. Uh, and the question is, who is often recognized as being the founder of Earth Day? So you can see if you can try and answer that. And uh, while you're looking at that and other folks are joining in the meeting, I'll do a, a little bit of introductions and uh, um, get us started here. Uh, so first things I should just say is uh, greetings on behalf of the Center for Renewable Energy Advanced Technological Education. And I should probably, uh, I should probably start by saying we hope everyone is safe and that you and your families are all staying healthy. Um, and also extend a special welcome to any uh, teachers or students who might be in online classes that are either joining us today live or, or viewing the recording of this presentation. And uh, we hope that you're, you're all able to finish out the semester um, you know, despite the so somewhat trying circumstances. Uh, I should tell you that the, uh, the Create Energy Center is working on a, a series of resources for online instruction during the COVID-19 epidemic. And we hope that you'll join us for uh, future programs in the upcoming weeks and, and also visit our website to access and download uh, past webinars, publications, and materials that are always available for free. Uh, uh, I'll say just a few things about uh, sort of uh, process and housekeeping during the presentation. Uh, we'll ask that the attendees keep your video and, and microphones muted during the presentation so that things run smoothly and we don't get too much background noise. Uh, if you have questions as we go, uh, feel welcome to type those into the chat box and I'll monitor the chat box while our speaker is presenting and I'll organize those for our speaker to answer at the, uh, at the end of the, the presentation. Um, so uh, the poll here who is often recognized as being the founder of Earth Day and I, I gave you five choices, Rachel Carlson, Aldo Leopold, Theodore Roosevelt, Richard Nixon and Gaylord Nelson. And all of those individuals certainly had something to do with, uh, with the environmental movement and um, sustainability of, of natural resources. Uh, the correct answer is E, Senator Gaylord Nelson, who is, a, or I should say was, a senator from the state of Wisconsin, which is also where I'm speaking to you from today and where our presenter is from today. Our, our speaker is uh, Gregory Nemet from the University of Wisconsin, Madison, La Follette School of Public Affairs. Uh, Professor Nemet teaches courses in policy analysis, energy systems, and international environmental policy. His research focuses on understanding the processes of technological change and the ways in which public policy can affect it. Uh, Professor Nemet received his bachelor's degree in geography and economics from Dartmouth and his doctorate in energy and resources from the University of California, Berkeley. He received an Andrew Carnegie Fellowship in 2017 and used it to research and write his recently published book, How Solar Energy Became Cheap, a Model for Low Carbon Innovation. He's also a lead author for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Sixth Assessment Report. And last year he was awarded the inaugural World Citizen Prize in environmental performance by the Association for Public Policy Analysis and Management. So without further delay, I'm going to yield the mic to Professor Nemet for today's presentation. Great, thanks Ken. And let me see if I could just share my screen with you here. All right, are those slides coming through now? Great. Okay, yep. Looks yeah, good, so, um, great, I'll go ahead. Um, yeah, it's great, thanks for the introduction, Ken, and it's, it's really nice to be able to do this, uh, you know, connect with people online, even if we're in these uh, strange circumstances. So I appreciate the, uh, the people attending and also the organizers of Ken and Gabby for, for having this go forward. So it's nice to have the opportunity. Yeah, and maybe I'll just start with my um, overall perspective for why I do this work. And, and that's better, that I think we can make better choices about future technologies that we'll need to deal with climate change and other challenges associated with the energy system. We can make those better choices by better understanding how technologies have evolved in the past. 
and especially by understanding successful technologies. And there's no question that solar PV has been a successful technology. And that's really my motivation for, uh, for spending a lot of effort and time on this uh, and then for talking to you about it um, today. So I guess the, the three main points that I hope you take away from uh, my effort to answer this question, which is how did solar energy become cheap? First of all, from kind of a national perspective, no one country did it. So it's really a relay race uh, that started mostly in a sequence of first the US, then Japan, then Germany, some contributions from Australia, and then China. And that, that sequence of efforts where each country contributed distinct capabilities, added something that other countries had not added to date, um, really was how this all worked. So that's pretty important uh, takeaway from me for PV and for other technologies as well. Second is how important what I call international flows of knowledge were. So people that had learned something, had some experience, had some tacit knowledge in their heads, moving around the world, seeing things that had worked in other countries, bringing it back to their home country, getting trained in another country, then going to work in some other country, and then maybe going back to their home country after that, and then maybe serving markets uh, far afield from where they're producing uh, solar PV. So those international flows of knowledge have been crucial from the very beginning, and the beginning is quite a long time ago um, from what I'll talk about in a little bit. So the first point was on no one country did it. Second point is how important these international flows of knowledge have been. And then third, if we're thinking about solar being a model for other technologies, we have to learn how to apply that model much more quickly because solar developed far too slowly to say that we're gonna apply that model to other technologies. And I'll talk more about that later. So that's a big implication in the main policy implications that I work on now coming out of this work is how can we speed up innovation? Because even though solar was successful, it was way too slow to do that for another technology. So that's what I wanna to get to uh, in, the, in the slides um, coming up and I'll make sure to, to finish so there's time uh, for Q&A because that's usually my, my favorite part of, of doing a, a talk about the, about the book. So, um, but just before I get into delving into this question, let me put up a couple of um, items on context. And the first is that what made this book fun instead of just a lot of work uh, was having a great team of, of students to, to work with. People that, you know, Travis, I think, did more on understanding the Japanese role in solar than has been published in English before. Atia performing uh, interviews in different places around the world, Rohan getting data, Jackie helping me navigate the, the policy context and, and talking to people uh, in Beijing and other parts of China. Andy Lick helped me actually install a solar panel where you see <laughs> a picture of us doing that there just to get a little sense of, of how that worked, but also had a lot of insights on, on the learning that happens among installers, which you used to do. And then Michaela did a lot of work uh, on the on the drafts of the uh, uh, of the paper to to make it easier to to read and finally um, become a book that people um, would be readable. So great team to work with. That was a lot of fun. The second part, and this is the less fun part, is when I talk about my uh, in my classes on energy systems. A lot of it I orient it around this question, maybe the first thing is we need an energy transition to deal with energy problems, but first to, to add some sober reality, which is that energy transitions are hard. And I say they're hard for three reasons. So first reason is that we disagree on what we want from an energy system. I think we might all agree that we want an energy system that's cheap, that's clean, and that's reliable, but we disagree on what cheap means does it mean we want gas that's a dollar a gallon, like it sounds like it is now, uh, or five dollars a gallon? Um, or is this about energy that's accessible to the couple billion people in the world who still use traditional biomass as their main means of energy? And then do we want cheap, clean, or reliable? If those are trade-offs, we can disagree uh, strongly about which is the most important. So that's the first part that makes energy transitions hard. The second is that they're slow. If you look in the past at transitions 
from wood being the dominant energy carrier 170 years ago to coal being the most important energy source 100 years ago and oil that took over as being the dominant energy source about 50 or 60 years ago, the transition from one to another, even though they'd been around for a while and had attractive uh, characteristics about them, it took decades for them to really attain this kind of dominant uh, position as a primary energy carrier. And if we're thinking about doing something similar to a new transition that's maybe based on low carbon, uh, we don't have the time of spending 60 or 70 years to get to a different set of energy carriers that have the attribute of being low carbon. So that's another uh, thing. We need things to happen faster than in the past. And then third, if we're thinking about climate change, a really important aspect of uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is, you know, we were just talking about the question about Earth Day. Um, you know, a lot of the accomplishments that happened after Earth Day in the 1970s and into the 80s were about removing pollutants like sulfur dioxide that cause acid rain or particulates that cause health effects in kids. Those have the benefit is that once they're in the atmosphere, they get rained out or fall out within a few weeks. Uh, so if you stop putting more of it into the atmosphere, the problem goes away. That's not true with CO2 because once we put it up there, it stays for around 100 years. So that makes the system much less responsive to us, even if we do uh, really important efforts to clean it up. So for these three reasons, we disagree, transitions are slow, and then CO2 is a stock pollutant in the atmosphere problem. Uh, energy transitions are hard. And so I s ask myself and my students, why bother if this is such a difficult problem? And I think one thing that's helped me is that I've developed a set of reasons to be optimistic that we can actually deal with these problems in a time relevant way. And, you know, it would actually be fun to do a talk where I just, you know, go into each of these eight, list of these eight examples of reasons to be optimistic because one, each of these has become more convincing over time. Like this number eight, I put as young adults being important because they have a big stake in the problem. You know, I, I've had that as on my slides for 10 years as a way to kind of motivate the people that are in my classes. Um, but in the last 18 months, that's really taken off in a way that I think a lot of people hadn't seen coming, but what has been important for other uh, social problems. The one I'll talk about today uh, is number one, because I see that as the one that's been the most dynamic and the one that underpins a lot of the other ones. It makes the other reasons for optimism more credible. Um, because underneath it all, while politicians have been dithering about what to do about climate change for 40 years, almost, you could say now, um, technology has been improving. The costs have been coming down, performance is becoming better, and the reliability is improving as well. And so all of those changes um, allow us to do things in a policy space that would not have been considered feasible or realistic even a few years ago. And so that's a big reason why uh, I like to study how these things have happened. So let me just uh, make another point to start um, into on the solar part, which is just to make sure if anyone is not clear about it, that solar panels are now extremely cheap. Um, this is a graph of cost of solar and the uh, indicator, the, the vertical axis there is dollars per megawatt hour. So for people that, aren't that familiar with energy units. And I would say the people at the beginning of my class that I teach in the fall would not be familiar with energy units, but by the end, I hope they are. Um, but there's a, a quick heuristic here is that one megawatt hour is the average electricity consumption of a US residential single family home. So this is basically a household electricity bill in the US. And that dashed line is grid electricity, something like $120 per month you have to pay. And then if you plot solar on there, you can see the cost of solar much higher than that grid electricity in the 90s and 2000s, but coming down quite a bit. And then if we plot, um, and then you can see those dots on the right there. Those are experts assessments of where they thought the cost of solar would be in 2030. You can see quite a range there from costs that are uh, above where solar was in say 2000 to some that are uh, well below grid electricity. And then if we plot the blue dots there, so those are a million homes in the US for which we have the prices for what they paid to install electricity. And then if you figure out how sunny it is where they install it, 
uh, you can calculate the cost of electricity uh, per month or per megawatt hour uh, for their electricity. And then that line in the middle there is that uh, average of those prices over time. You can see there's a lot of dispersion. So some people are paying a lot for their electricity and some are paying below grid electricity. And you can see that average has been going down over time. And that's the dynamic I'm really interested in is that the slope of that curve and the shape of that curve. Here are a few dots I just put up there. Uh, the filled dots are US utility scale solar installations. So generally cheaper to have bigger installations on a dollars per megawatt hour um, basis. And those have gotten cheaper over time as well. And then those open circles on the bottom right are from other countries. Those are power purchase agreements. And some of those power purchase agreements are really cheap. So they're, uh, let me focus on that bottom part there. So this is that same data, just with the scale going up to 250 instead of uh, six or 800 as I had before. So if you look at those power purchase agreements, and I saw one last week that was even lower than this, so it was around $14. But those lowest ones there, about $19 per megawatt hour, $19 a month for electricity, that's uh, lower than the most optimistic prediction by the most optimistic experts when we interviewed them in 2010. So solar is really cheap beyond expectations. And it's now in sunny places and those open circles at the bottom right there give evidence to that. It's really the cheapest way that humans have ever been able to produce electricity at scale. And so that's why I'm interested in is how did this happen? And the other thing about solar is it's the only technology that's behaved in this manner, that's gotten cheap rapidly. You can see the same thing for wind and for battery storage as well. They have these steep curves of costs going down over time. And with solar and batteries, it looks like there's plenty of room to run on those cost reductions. There's a lot more reasons why uh, batteries and solar could get cheaper still and wind uh, as well, maybe with a less uh, steep curve there. So that's this book project here is to look at three questions. So how did this happen? Number two, why did it happen so slowly? And three, uh, looking at how this could be a model for other uh, technologies that we might need to, to address climate change. Okay, so I guess to put this whole story on one picture, this, might, this would be my main attempt at doing that. So the first number to take away is 10 to the negative fourth. So that's a factor of 10,000. So solar today is a factor of 10,000 cheaper than the first solar. And so let's see how that looks uh, over time here. So we've got 70 years of time horizon here. And then we've got a logarithmic scale here. So each of those uh, labels for the Y axis there is a factor of 10. So we've gone from about $200,000 per megawatt hour down to $20 per megawatt hour. So that's the factor of 10,000. The story starts with Einstein and understanding activation energy and the scientists at Bell Labs in the 1940s that were working on inventing the transistor and then understanding ways that they could make um, data communications happen and how you might get power for that. Invented the first efficient solar cell uh, but they really used Einstein's theory of how uh, the atomic structure works, and especially that uh, finding for which Einstein won the Nobel Prize. It wasn't relativity or quantum mechanics. Einstein won the Nobel Prize for understanding and predicting how light interacts with atomic structures. And that idea of activation energy led to the scientists at Bell Labs working on the PN junction and working with semiconductors and to get a current to be induced by photons uh, dislodging electrons in, in uh, silicon material. And they came out with a work in 94 and they had a big press conference for it. It was a 5% efficient solar cell and it got on the cover of the New York Times in April of 1954 that uh, scientists may have just discovered a new energy technology that could power the world with almost limitless uh, resource. So that was the, the, the dawn of the large solar electric age in 1954. Um, then we've got a short period or the period in the 50s and 60s where not that much happens. There's some false dawns that occur again. Uh, but the next big push was in 1973 
when uh, the Arab oil embargo happened and all of a sudden five countries were not able to access Middle Eastern oil because they were blocked uh, for supporting Israel. And those countries, especially the US, but even more so Japan, launched their own efforts to use science and technology to deal with the oil crisis. And Japan had its project Sunshine for which solar was a big part. And the US had project Independence for which turning coals into liquid fuels and nuclear power were a big part. Solar was a small part of Project Independence in the US, but the small part it had was gigantic compared to any resources that had gone into solar uh, in the past. And in the late 70s, about a billion dollars of R&D goes into solar in the US. There's a lot of technology that comes out of that period uh, in the 1970s, both in the US and then in Japan. The other uh, milestone I'll point to here is this, probably the one that's probably least known of the, of the milestones on this chart here. And that is uh, 1978, uh, the federal government uh, issued a, a law, a regulation called the Public Utilities Regulatory Policy Act. And that basically said that small scale producers of energy had to be able to sell their electricity onto the grid and the grid operators had to offer them a price that reflected the avoided cost of the grid operator. So if a small scale generator, whether it's natural gas or geothermal or wind, could make money at this avoided cost, then the uh, utilities had to buy electricity from them. And it took a while for that to really be implemented in a real effective way. And it was really up to the states and the public utilities commissions in each state to really figure out a way to make that work. The one that finally worked was in California with their interim standard offer contract number four, where they came up with standardized language that any producer could use and that all utilities had to sign on to. And it also established the rates at which utilities would compensate uh, the small scale producers for it. That did nothing for solar. Solar was still way too expensive in the 1980s to make any, make any money at those rates. But wind power was able to do that. And about a $2 billion of Wall Street money went into the wind power uh, sector in California in the 1980s because of these standard offer contracts. And I'll come back to that one because the Germans in 2000 with their EEG, German for Renewable Energy Law, used that idea of a guaranteed purchase price over a long period of time um, that led to the biggest solar market in the world and was really probably the most transformative policy on this chart here. Another policy innovation, and that's uh, Japan with its rooftop program in 1995 was the first to provide rebates to consumers. So this is not about um, large scale utilities or even companies producing power, which the wind in the US was about companies doing it. This was about consumers, residences producing their own electricity and subsidies. And there was a large uh, response to the, the rebates that the Japanese offered and led to about 200,000 homes installing solar in the 1990s in Japan. And then the ones I'd like to focus on a little bit, because these are really the core of the more recent trajectory with solar, are what the Germans did and then what the Chinese did. And I guess just to, to pause here for one, come up for air for a little bit, there's really three stages to the reductions in the cost of solar. It was the US that created a technology, and you can see the timing on this slide here, it looks like that's from the 50s through the 80s. Then it was the Germans creating a market, and they really did that starting with the EEG in the 2000s. And then it was the Chinese making it cheap, which also started around the same time that the Germans made that market. So it's really creating a technology, creating a market, and then making it cheap. And I think that is the sequence um, that ho hopefully we could see in other, other technologies in the future. So let me just drill down for a minute or two on, uh, on the, what Germany did and then what China did. Uh, yeah, I'll come back to this one a little bit. Um, so Germany, the first thing that happens in the late 1990s is that a policy window opens up. And this is something that we don't really have in the US in the same way because the way our party system works. But in Germany, because it's a parliamentary system, a small party that gets 10 to 15% of the votes can be really important in terms of determining who gets to rule and thus get their policies put on the national agenda. And the Green Party did that in an election in 1998. And the, one of the main things they put on the agenda 
was subsidies for renewable energy. And these are the two people that really uh, pushed this through um, on the bottom from the Green Party and on the top from the, the Social Democratic Party. So first of all, there's this policy window that opens up with this 99 election, 1998 election, and the Greens are ready to go with, with policy. And the policy that they had was called a feed-in tariff. And it was really this idea of policy diffusion, take ideas from elsewhere and combine them and update them. So they took this idea of a guaranteed contract that California was offering for wind power and this idea of creating incentives directly to consumers, which the Japanese did with their rooftop program. And the Germans combined this into what they called a feed-in tariff. So you get a guaranteed price that was even more generous than what California was doing in the 80s. And it was even more reliable because instead of a 10 year guaranteed price, they're giving a 20 year guaranteed price. And then they're doing it just for consumers uh, like the Japanese did. And one of the impacts of having such a long uh, guarantee of 20 years is it made the financing really cheap for these. So Germans were financing their PV installations at like 2% cost of capital. And this is in a place where labor costs and other costs are generally pretty high and, and the banking system is a bit more restricted than it is in the US, but because this policy was so reliable, uh, people were able to borrow at very low rates and that further uh, reduced the effective cost of, of solar PV. So that was the second part, policy diffusion. And by doing that, by implementing this policy, they created tremendous demand. And you can see that this policy started in 2000, became more generous in 2004. And so the German market increased by a factor of seven in that first year of the policy, and then increased by gigawatts in the years after that, up to the point that it was doing more than seven gigawatts per year at its peak in the 2009 to 2011 period. And so one of the most important things to take away from this uh, look at this demand that was created by the German policy is that it didn't just create a lot of installed PV and offset pollution because of that, that was a positive thing, but it also created expectations that there'd be demand in the future. And it led to investment. And it wasn't just investment in installing lots of solar panels, it was investment in training people to install solar panels. And crucially, what became really important was investment in machinery that wasn't just borrowed as secondhand from the computer industry, but that was purposed just for solar for the solar industry because the industry was big enough that you could justify investing tens of millions of dollars into developing a new wire saw that was specifically made for slicing wafer for solar panels instead of doing the same for the computer industry where the, uh, the, the technical needs were a little bit different. And so after all this, the Germans talk about it as their gift to the world and their gift to the world, again, it wasn't the gigawatts of solar that gets installed in Germany it's the creation of a market, the expectations of the demand, investment that goes into meeting that demand and all the cost reductions that emerged because there was such a large, incredible market that was expected to last for years. And the ones that really did that work uh, were the Chinese. Uh, and then you can see on this graph, some of the changes that happened in that period where solar manufacturing plants got much bigger, the efficiency of solar modules about doubled, the silicon price came way down, uh, wafers got wider and thinner and more of them could be used in the end, that's the, the yield part. So all these technical improvements uh, led to low cost solar as well. The ones that really accomplished most of this uh, were the Chinese. And there's really two periods to the Chinese story. There's the uh, 2000 to 2010 period, and then there's after 2010. And the 2000 2009 period was really about scrappy entrepreneurship and the central government had a very small role. After 2010, the central government has a really big role to play in kind of protecting the, the large Chinese firms that emerged from that. So it's really two parts of a story. But this first time or this first period is really about scrappy entrepreneurs and the uh, the, I mean, I think one short story that really uh, clarifies some of these international linkages here was um, this guy, Martin Green, who is a, a scientist trained uh, from Australia, trained in Canada, went to the US uh, to understand how companies were making solar there and then brought that knowledge back to Australia and started a laboratory there. 
he hired a, uh, a grad student as a translator to go on a trip. That's this guy on the right here, Zheng Gongxi. And so Green and, Zhe and Gong as the uh, translator went to China in 1994 to try to set up solar manufacturing there. And they came away saying it was impossible. There's no infrastructure. No one was interested in having them come there. There's no way to finance uh, building a solar manufacturing plant there. And so they tried to do uh, solar manufacturing in India instead, and that didn't work either. So eventually they just built their company uh, in, in Australia with some funding from the local electric utility there. And Zheng Rongxi was the chief technology officer at that company, Pacific Solar. And then over time, he's in touch with his um, friends and, and relatives in China, and he starts to get the, the indication that things are starting to change there, that there might be more interest in companies coming in and, and setting up new ventures. And so in 2000, he moved his family to Wuxi and started to set up a manufacturing line there, really scrappy, just without much money. They had about $5 million to start. They traveled around the world buying other people's secondhand equipment that they weren't using anymore, brought it back and set up a small manufacturing line of about 10 megawatts a year, got that to work. They built a second line at 30 megawatts and a third line at 80 megawatts. And as they were doing this, they start to find that they're able to convince the Germans that they can, uh, that their technology is reliable enough that the Germans are, are willing to try it and use it for their, uh, to satisfy the demand, which they can't meet themselves. And that's really where that company, SunTech, um, becomes a giant company by satisfying that uh, German market. They did need to scale up. And so they need the money to do that, to buy new equipment, to uh, invest in training workers and buying expensive material like silicon at the time was really expensive. And they did this, and this is important, not with you, uh, Chinese central government funds and only a little bit of local funding. Most of it came from US pension funds. So SunTech, that company, and about five or six other companies in this period of 2004 to 2008, uh, all went public on New York Stock Exchange. And so it's really, U.S. pension funds that are investing in these Chinese solar startups, the startups are using the money from those uh, IPOs to purchase equipment from Switzerland, from Germany, and from the U.S., bring that equipment to China, use it to set up production lines, manufacture solar modules, and then sell those modules first to Germany, and then to Spain, and then to Italy, then to U.K., then to California, and then to other parts of the world as well. So it's really this... Uh, uh, this entrepreneurial competitive environment that really launches the solar industry in China and gets it to be inter internationally competitive. After 2009 and the global financial crisis, then it's really a different story. Then the central government at that point realizes the solar industry is legitimate. It invests heavily in those companies, puts about 10 to $20 billion of low cost loans uh, to keep those companies afloat during the financial crisis when other countries were cutting their subsidies for solar markets. The Chinese start their own feed-in tariff and by 2013, they're not only the largest producer of solar panels, uh, but they're also the biggest purchasers of solar panels. So it's a really a two-part story there. And then this, in this recent period, it's really about two factors. It's about intense competition and about automation as well. And so in that first uh, slide there, you can see the share of global production by the largest company in the world. When the U.S. was the dominant producer of solar in the 90s, we had companies that had a third of the world market. And when Japan was the biggest producer in the 2000s, Sharp has all, almost also a third of the world's production. But no Chinese company, even SunTech, ever got above 10% of the world's production. And so it's a much more competitive market. There aren't the margins that there were in the 90s and 2000s. That's a big reason why costs have come down. And the other big reason is really, it's not about a labor cost advantage in China. It's about um, investing heavily in automation. And that's what that slide is. And so if you look at uh, a picture here of a solar uh, manufacturing facility in China there, you can see how many people are working on this factory. This is not a place that takes advantage of uh, the wage difference between the U.S. and Germany and China. It's a place that's using technology from all over the world. 
replicating some of that technology uh, by reverse engineering it and making their own versions of it where they can and where they can't, they just buy and optimize technology from other places and, and make it work together and then make it happen at a scale that no one else was, was thinking of. You know, I think uh, one quote I got from uh, when I was doing interviews for the book um, who said in the 2000s when the Europeans and the Americans were thinking of production in terms of tens or hundreds of megawatts of solar a year, the Chinese were talking in terms of gigawatts. And we now have companies that are making more than a billion watts of solar a year. And there's a, a recently in the last couple of weeks, there's an announcement for a kind of a phased in approach to do a, a facility would do something on the order of 20 gigawatts of solar a year. So a scale that was just order of magnitude larger than what other places were doing and, and they pulled it off. They were able to make it happen. They were able to fund it. And crucially, they were able to make and sell um, the, the production that came out of it for the most part. So just to put this together um, and get away from some of the, the interesting stories that I found really fun and interesting, but also to try to think about it in a way that we could apply it to other technologies. How does solar get cheap? It's really a combination of those three stages of creating a technology, of building a market, and then of getting the cost out. When I say creating a technology, some of it is just Einstein, scientific understanding, or maybe understanding how new materials like perovskites work and how they respond to light and what happens when they degrade. So there's something to R&D that's a big part of that. And it's not just R&D at the beginning or in the 1970s, it's R&D all the way along and, and still is important uh, today. That third uh, row under creating a technology on knowledge spillovers, that was crucial of people, of, of knowledge moving from one person to another, from one company to another, and from one country to another. That was such a big part of what made the solar industry uh, work and function and improve over time. Uh, second, on building a market, so I talked quite a bit about the Germans doing that, but they borrowed policy ideas from other places. Um, credibility and that long-term commitment to a fixed price was really important. But other parts of the market I haven't talked about were also important. So early on, the first commercial markets for solar were in satellites. And so when the Russians launched Sputnik in 1957, there's a picture of that here, that created the, a first real market for solar PV and the, and the uh, solar panels on the Vanguard One satellite in 1958 worked really well and operated for seven years, which is way better uh, than the lead-acid batteries that were the other alternative or the um, nuclear reactors that didn't get applied uh, as much for satellites. A second part under building a market is modular scale. So the really distinct aspect of solar is that it's been applied at very small scale. So you can think about other niche markets like watches and calculators that the Chinese or the Japanese did a lot of in the 1980s. That's about a watt of application to the largest installations in the world that are going in. It was Egypt and I guess India, the biggest ones, but those are gigawatt scale of solar. And so you've got a factor of a billion from the smallest application to the largest application and almost every level, almost every scale in between has been used. And that just gave a lot of flexibility about different markets that solar could reach, whether it's telecom repeater stations or working on oil rigs or off-grid houses or now utility scale and then community scale, lots of different markets. And compare that to one single uh, large technology, which, which could either go in or not. Uh, solar had a lot of different possibilities. Robust policy support was also important. And I use the word robust there in two ways. So one strong, so the German policy had a high um, compensation about 54 cents per kilowatt hour. And think of our electricity is about 12 cents per kilowatt hour. And German maybe is double that 20, 25 cents per kilowatt hour. And they were offering 54 cents if you produce that from solar. So that was generous, that makes it robust and strong, but also robust. And this is why there are three pictures of capitals here in that if one, policy went away. So if there was an election in Germany and conservatives took over, didn't want to have a renewable subsidy anymore. Well, a new market emerged in Spain and another one in Italy. And then California started its big market. Then China started it, its gigantic market. 
And so the idea that it, you didn't have to depend on one policy, I thought made it much easier to invest in scaling up in the equipments and all the other efforts that are needed to, to satisfy and grow that market. So that's on building market. And then in terms of making it cheap, a lot of it is learning by doing, it's iteration, it's going small scale and then going up to bigger scale from small, but in doing it in a sequence of stages so that every time you go to the next scale or you build a new manufacturing line, you make it better. You learn something from what didn't work, you figure out a new way to do things better. There's so many opportunities to do that with solar. Um, you know, if you think about the difference between a small scale technology like solar and a large scale one like say nuclear reactors, there have only been about a thousand nuclear reactors built in the history of that technology. And there have been uh, to date about 2 billion solar panels built in the history of solar. And so that's a million times as many chances to improve, to find ways to get costs out, to change the production um, that you don't get if you're only building dozens of them uh, or hundreds like a nuclear reactor. And then the delayed system integration, if you do a large scale like coal power plant or a nuclear reactor or a bioenergy system, you have to get the system integration right from the beginning. And solar where the big system integration challenge is really about how do you deal with an intermittent resource on electric grid but solar really didn't have to deal with that until it gets to more than a few percent of electricity supply, which only has happened in the last 10 or 15 years. And it had 50 years before that for the technology to mature and improve before it had to deal with these bigger systemic issues. And that, that makes it a lot easier to kind of um, phase in that really hard system integration challenge. So I think I'll stop there. I'm happy to answer uh, questions. Um, but yeah, just to, to sum up, maybe like if I think about answering that question of how did solar get cheap, I see these as really the drivers of it. The international flows of knowledge were really crucial for that. It happened way too slow. So we need to find ways to make this happen faster if we do this um, for other technologies. And then finally, you know, it wasn't any single country. It wasn't China, it wasn't Germany, it wasn't the US. It was really the combination, the sequence of them, each doing their part um, that led to what we have today which is a low cost, plentiful resource that has low impacts on the environment that we can think about using in new and creative ways. And I think that's really the, the challenge for us, uh, regardless of where the, the manufacturing of, of the cells and modules happen. So I'll, I'll stop there. Hey, thanks, Greg. That was, uh, that was fantastic. Uh, we've got a, a few questions that have come in over the chat box, and I'm sure folks have a, a few more as well. We've got about 15 minutes or so together here that we can uh, have a little Q&A. Uh, let, me, let me give you one of them that came across here, Greg, and I'm sure you've heard this before. Uh, your research showed this really large cost reduction that happened over several decades with solar. Um, and, and the question is, can we expect this trend to continue? And and maybe more uh, directly on pocketbook impacts, uh, should I buy solar panels now or wait another five to 10 years when they're gonna be cheaper? Yeah, okay, so good questions. Um, I see the, the trends continuing. So the, the cost continuing to fall down. Um, you know, the, the things that have uh, led to low cost solar are continue to happen. So more automation, larger scale. So I just mentioned two weeks ago, we've got, you know, a scale that's up by factor of 10 now. Um, and we haven't at all, almost not at all, uh, moved into new materials. So we're really making solar 95% of the market is on this uh, slices of crystallized silicon. And there's other ways to do it. We can use just thin films of silicon. We can use thin films of other uh, materials and we can layer different materials together and those really are just getting started and they you know these other materials have a high hurdle to jump over is that they need to compete with silicon but if silicon runs into some kind of dead end in terms of cost reductions there are other other uh, materials to switch over to so that makes me think we can keep going but yeah that's a good question then is if that's likely to happen why not wait uh and that's you know that's been the challenge for any dynamic uh, technology is that there's always this idea of just waiting a little bit. And if you look at some of the um, 
power purchase agreements that have uh, happened in Wisconsin for solar in the last couple of years, if you look into those, um, a lot of them are have been signed, say in 2019, but the uh, electricity doesn't start flowing until 2021 or 2022. And it's not because it takes two or three years to build a solar farm. It, do, it takes a few months to do that. It's 2022 because these companies are waiting for a couple more years of cost reductions to, uh, to make that. So there is some anticipation built into it. Um, but then, you know, to take an exaggerated case, why not wait 10 years to do solar? Well, then you've missed 10 years of the benefits uh, of solar. So there is some kind of a intermediate. I think those, you know, more savvy than me people about figuring out that trade-off uh, have kind of made some compromise. It looks like a couple years of waiting is maybe optimal. There's a, uh, a question in the chat box here about uh, interconnection agreements and differences between states. And can you maybe comment a little bit about how the, the U.S. market as a whole is on a national scale versus regional disparities? Yeah, I mean, the, the devil's in the details in terms of whether solar is in the money for anyone as a consumer. It really comes down to uh, rate design. And it's not even like what I've been talking about, like what's the rate of your uh, grid electricity purchases, that is part of it, but it's really down to things like uh, what is the rate that you get if you overproduce from what you can consume? Are you getting like the 12 cents per kilowatt hour? Or are you getting something a lot less than that? Or in some cases you get more than that. So yeah, the rate design really is crucial for whether solar uh, makes people money or not, and a lot of that really comes down to uh, the public utilities commissions. They're the ones that I think have the biggest influence over how solar evolves in each state in the US. So this technologies matters, people's preferences for green matters, but in terms of the real uh, kind of financial impact of it, it's really up to what the public utilities commissions decide. And they're really in between consumers and the utilities who they're in charge of regulating. And so that's often overlooked about how influential a small number of people, like in Wisconsin, it's three people, um, the role that they play in whether uh, solar gets big or or stays small. So yeah, that's a, that's a good question to highlight. I'm gonna try and combine a couple questions together here. Um, it, it, do you think we've learned enough to shorten the, the research and development process for the, for the next technology or, or can we expect it to still be long and drawn out and, and sort of related to that, you know, maybe the next technology might be batteries. And, and the question is, do we need something like the German feed-in tariff for battery technology? Yeah. So those are, that's, a, those are a great questions. So I guess I'd say uh, three things on that. So, Yes, we have learned something. And, you know, I think we would have had cheap solar a while ago, five, 10 years earlier, 10 years, maybe 15. There was really a gap between when the US took its foot off the gas with solar, which is 1981. That's when we really disinvested in solar. Uh, and then when the Germans really uh, started pushing it in 2000. And so there's 15 or 20 years there where the Japanese kind of kept things going but I like to think of a counterfactual world in which the US or maybe some other country really picked up the ball and ran with it in the early 1980s. I think that would have sped up the development of solar, but I bet by 10 or 15 years. Um, and then, yeah, what can we do now? That's something that I uh, think about a lot is how do we speed things up? And one, uh, one set of policies I, I've been kind of working on is trying to think about, sorry, the get through these slides, but just, to, uh, yeah. So this is my list of things that I would want to emphasize if we wanted to apply the lessons from solar to something else, whether it's batteries or advanced nuclear technology or some other technology we'll need. It's things like R&D. It's uh, a trained workforce, so having lots of people that are able to work on these technologies and, and get them up to speed quickly, that's crucial. Uh, public procurement, so maybe the uh, governments being purchasers of these technologies, like you can think of uh, electric fleets for say the post office or for uh, municipalities 
it's just such a natural place to really get these uh, technologies moving. And then some of the knowledge spillover stuff I talked about, uh, and then the demand side, things like uh, robust markets and getting policies to make things move. So yeah, I think there, are, we could do something like for batteries and I think public procurement would make a lot of sense to get things going on that. But batteries look very similar to solar in a lot of ways. So if we can get a, a big enough market for them where there's credibility that they'll grow, it's not just that the market will grow, it's that the technology will get better and that'll be self-sustaining. We won't need subsidies as much anymore uh, because the costs come down. We've got a, a couple questions about uh, supply chains uh, and uh, raw materials like trace metals and stuff like that and the, uh, the, the materials required to manufacture either whether it be solar or batteries and, and how does that, that sort of supply issue play into the, the timeline? Yeah, I mean, it's something to take seriously for any technology when you're talking about doing something serious for the global energy system, because that system is so big. So that if we're talking about doing 30% of electricity from solar or 50%, we have to start paying attention to things like, yeah, what materials we're, we're using to fuel that. So I don't have it off the top of my head, but there's a good number for what percent of the Earth's crust is silicon. And it's a pretty, you know, I think a high single digit number. And so there's quite an abundance of that material, um, but it's also important to realize like once we start running out of something and it gets more expensive, we tend to be innovative about it. We tend to find ways to get by with using less of it or be more careful with how we use it. And so I, we have not seen those signals come up yet that we're running into material constraints, but you know, there's a lot of more scale to come with solar. And so that's something, that's actually something I've been tasked with in my, IPCC work is to really survey what the resource requirement constraints might be uh, for solar. So that's a good uh, question that other people are asking and, and similar for batteries uh, as well. Yeah. So Greg, as, as, you were, uh, as you were writing your book, the, the US engaged in this big trade war with Europe and, and Asia, and uh, we saw tariffs imposed on, on foreign made solar panels. Uh, what are your general thoughts on the on the solar tariffs and and can you comment more generally on on how disputes like trade wars might impact the underlying research and development mechanisms that you describe in your book yeah that's a good question yeah so well when i talk about that chinese case you know the 2000s it's really about scrappy entrepreneurs but after 2009 the central government is providing 20 billion dollars in low-cost loans and the Europeans were quick on this in 2010 about uh, filing a case with the W, the World Trade Organization, saying that that's unfair subsidies. The Obama administration followed in 2011 with their own case and imposing their own tariffs on Chinese solar panels. Uh, and then the Trump administration in 2017 came up with their own additional tariffs as well. And so there has been this, yeah, to some extent, it's it's. I guess one thing I'd say is that there does seem to be a case in the Trump administration, and it's not, you know, it's been explicit of, of wanting there to be a trade war because, you know, the U.S. is not getting a, a fair deal with China. And so it's interesting that solar is a big enough industry now or considered strategic enough that it's been pretty front and center in some of the initial um, tariffs that have, that have gone in. And so I, one thing is I think it shows uh, how, big an industry solar is now. Um, but I think it's legitimate too that, you know, China was really subsidizing the solar industry and that gave them a leg up on the Europeans and on the US as well. Um, but yeah, I do think that there is an issue in terms of if we want to accelerate this model, that whole middle slice of this slide here on knowledge flows is really about how do we get knowledge to move where it needs to go faster? That's sometimes people moving around, it's machines moving from one place to another. Uh, and it's really about taking advantage of the distinct capabilities in different places. And the US has some, you know, unrivaled capabilities in, you know, using artificial intelligence or doing advanced manufacturing or coming up with some of the, the radical new designs for whether it's batteries or solar panels or new materials for solar panels. But China has this also distinct competence, which is different. And it's more about scaling up technology and producing it reliably at really low cost. And so to do this, to accelerate 
the development of these technologies, we need to be taking advantage of those uh, capabilities that happen in different places. And the idea that we're going to constrain innovation, restrict it to one place, like have it all happen in China, if that's what the Chinese want, or for the US to have it all happen in the US. I can see why people would advocate that for kind of a national security grounds, maybe, or, or to protect manufacturing. But I have no doubt that that will slow down innovation. And I think with this case of energy and climate issues, we can't afford to slow things down. We need to speed things up. And so that's my biggest concern about a, a trade war persisting is that it, it slows down innovation. Yeah, understood, understood. Uh, we've got time for maybe one more question here, Greg. Um, okay. So, uh, and this is probably the most difficult one, but we're going to ask you to put on your forecasting hat. Uh, you know, currently we're in the midst of this uh, big COVID-19 epidemic. Uh, we've seen some recent labor studies that show that the clean energy sector has lost about 100,000 jobs already and, and that the, the solar market could contract by as much as 20% this year. Um, what are your thoughts about the, the long-term impact of this outbreak on the solar market? And, and more generally, how might, how might research development and tech transfer be changed in a, in a post-COVID-19 environment? Well, you're right, that is a hard question. And <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, I find it pretty hard to figure out how things will turn out. Uh, you know, it probably depends. I, it probably depends on how long kind of the, especially the economy is kind of at a slow pace how much it affects kind of international travel and supply chains over the longer term. And that, that's somewhat of an unknown. And then also in terms of, you know, there's been a lot of uh, federal funding that's gone into, you know, r relief for uh, employment in, in states uh, in the last couple of weeks. And sometimes that's called stimulus, but that's not really stimulus. It's really relief. No one's really trying to uh, stimulate the economy now because people are, you know, they're too constrained about where they can move. But at some point we will be doing real stimulus to get things moving again. And I think that's a real open possibility about how much of that real stimulus, whether it happens in a couple months or later, uh, gets directed towards clean technologies. Because there's really a chance to do that. Uh, the Europeans have talked about doing this with their uh, green deal and the South Koreans are already saying that their post COVID uh, stimulus will be mainly a, a clean energy stimulus. And so the extent to which we do that here, uh, I think will, will play a big role in terms of whether uh, these sectors, like you're saying with the job losses, recover recover quickly uh, or not as quickly. And, you know, there's certainly a, an outcome where they could grow in a way that um, they hadn't grown before. And so that's the part that I'd be most interested in finding a way to uh, to have happen. I think that's the question all of us are grappling with right now. And I, I get asked it almost every day. <laughs> so, so it'll be interesting to see how that plays out over the months ahead. Yeah. Um, uh, Greg, I want to thank you so much for spending time with us today and, and sharing thoughts about your book. Uh, for all of the, the folks that are on the, the call here, uh, just to let you know, the recording will be made available on the Create website. Um, and uh, let me just try and take back the screen for a second here, if I can. And I'll, uh, I'll put up a little quick promo, promo here for uh, our upcoming programming. Um, so uh, just to remind everybody, the website address is createenergy.org. And if you visit that website, the recording for this webinar will be under the publications tab. Um, you can also find all of our past uh, webinars there and recordings of those. Um, earlier this semester, we had uh, Mark Hansen speak on uh, the inevitable solar school and the solar schools of the future. Um, and then I'll also mention that uh, next week we have uh, Joe Sarubi joining us to uh, talk about um, clean energy career map tools. Uh, Joe has been involved in the development of a career map tool for the solar profession, as well as for tools for the HVAC sector. Um, and the Department of Energy has also developed similar tools for wind and, and bioenergy careers. And we'll take a look at those and uh, talk a little bit more about the solar workforce. So we'd invite any of you to, uh, to join us for that webinar. You can, you can email my, uh, my colleague, Gabby Temple. Her email address is there at the bottom of the slide and she'll get you all the information for the, uh, the webinar next Friday. Um, Greg, thanks again for 
spending your time with us and uh, I hope you, uh, you, you stay well and keep healthy. <laughs> Thank you, I really enjoyed it. Thanks for the great questions and, and the opportunity. Yeah, I'll send to you. Everybody have a afternoon. We'll see you next week. Thanks, everyone.